My name is Steve Brown. I'm with the Cantini First Division Oral History Project. It is Thursday, July 10th, 2008. We are in Blacklick, Ohio, and I'm here with Mr. Ted Keller, who resides in Millersport, Ohio. Mr. Keller, that's everything correct there? Yes. And we're here to talk about your experience in the First Division of the United States Army. I guess the best way to start out is why don't you give us a little background on yourself? Where were you born? When? I was born in uh, Lancaster, Ohio. Grew up in Mellisport. Uh, I was born in 1949. Uh, graduated from uh, Mellisport High School in 1967. Okay. And how big was your family? Uh, I had uh, two brothers and one sister. Any of your other siblings serve in the military? No. When did you join the Army? I was uh, drafted in the Army in uh, April 15, 1969. I would like to ask one other background question. Uh, did you practice any specific religion? I was a uh, Protestant or Methodist. Okay, and you grew up Methodist? Yes. Or? Okay. In, I'm sorry, now let's go back. When did you join the Army? I was uh, drafted in April 15, 1969. Okay. And... So you were drafted as opposed to enlisting. How did you yes. feel about that? I wasn't quite sure at the time there. Uh, I knew going in school that uh, there was a war going on over in Vietnam. I wasn't quite uh, sure how to accept that. Living in a rural area, we weren't uh, quite uh, up on what was going on as much as far as the big cities where they were having the riots at that time. How did you get your information about Vietnam at that time? Uh, basically through the local newspaper, the Columbus Dispatch, and so forth. Okay. When you joined, you were a citizen. How did you get transformed into a soldier? By going through basic training, uh, your instructors are, are trained to drill you, to accept combat, to be a little more violent in your training, uh, to be aggressive. That was probably the uh, biggest changeover. Uh, they yelled at you quite a bit, tried to tear you down before they built you up. Typical basic training in AIT training. AIT means? Adva advanced individual training, which in my case was infantry. Okay. What did they do to teach you to become more aggressive? Uh, everything you did were low crawling or uh, with uh, running. You was uh, competing against one another. Uh, or marching, you're still competing, or singing songs of with aggressive nature. What did you think about that whole experience? It was a learning experience. Uh, being from the north, uh, most of our instructors were from the su south, and they kind of spoke a little bit southern language, uh, which uh, at the time it took a little bit hard to understand. In terms of demographics, what kind of you came? You grew up in Millersport, which you have indicated was a rural area. What kind of people live in Millersport? I say uh, average Midwest, uh, Middle American, primarily white folks. Yes. Okay. When you got into the army, was it different then? In basic training, we had a uh, probably about 15% uh, black, and we had a, probably another 10% uh, Puerto Rican at the time. Uh, the whites seemed to get along with, well with the blacks and the Puerto Ricans, but the, the Puerto Ricans and the blacks could not get along well very long in basic training. Why do you say that? I think uh, they, one side was jealous of the other. Uh, uh, I know they got in fights all the time, and uh, just seems like... Uh, one side was afraid the other side was going to get head up just a little bit. Okay. What, mm, how was that dealt with? Usually the uh, squad leaders or platoon sergeants or the trainers would uh, take them aside and instruct them, talk with them, try to settle them down, uh, try to uh, bring uh, maybe the uh, uh, chaplain in to work with them to uh, get them work together a little bit better. Did it seem to work? In some cases it did. Uh, but one night it finally came to a head towards the end of basic training and they had a little bit of a riot outside and, and uh, a few heads got bumped. What were the circumstances that gave rise to that? I think part of the, uh, if it came to details, part of the problem was that uh, 
It seemed like the Puerto Ricans uh, said uh, they, uh, no comprende, they didn't understand English at the time there. So the, the whites and blacks pulled most of the details, and the Puerto Ricans kind of escaped on it. And they got, didn't have to pull a number of details, and most of them spoke English as well as we did. What, what do you mean when you say they pulled a detail? Uh, where it be uh, guard duty or go out and pull in KP and have to scrub pans or uh, maybe going out and scrub trucks or uh, sweep the floors, scrub the, polish the floors. Uh, they would try to get out of most of the details that way. So there was a sense that there were those who felt they weren't carrying their own weight? Correct. As a group? Yes. Okay. What happened in this when the heads got bumped? Uh, they got into a fight outside, and uh, about that time the MPs were called, and uh, they separated the groups and took them into different areas and held them for the rest of the night. How many people did this involve? How many? Probably men? 35 to 40. And this was towards the end of your basic training? Yes, I believe it was uh, next to last night. Were there any disciplinary actions taken that you know of? Not that I know of. I wasn't in on any of that. Okay. Were they with you when you graduated from yes, basic? Yes, yes. Okay. All those parties were still yes. there. Okay. So you finished. How did you feel when you finished basic training? You had a feel of accomplishment, uh, something you hadn't done before, and uh, you had a little more pride in your uniform. You knew how to act as a soldier and how to dress, who to salute, who not to salute. Um, then you went to AIT. Yes. I'm sorry, where did you do your basic training? Basic training was at, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. AIT was there also. Okay, and what, what did AIT consist of? AIT was uh, basically infantry training, it was uh, how to uh, move and fire in a squad size, how to fire various types of uh, weapons such as uh, uh, M60 machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, uh, the, the laws, uh, various other types of weapons usage. The laws? It's an anti-tank weapon. Laws rocket? Yes. Okay. And that's a disposable rocket? Yes. Okay. So you learned how to fire that? Correct. And you became fairly familiar with a 60 millimeter machine gun, is yes. that correct? How long did AIT last? I believe it was around uh, seven to nine weeks, I think. Seven to nine weeks. I believe around nine weeks, I think. And at that point, had you been assigned to the 1st Division yet? or No, uh, I wasn't assigned to the 1st Division until I arrived in South Vietnam. Okay. So from AIT, where did you go? From AIT, uh, we sent home for a 30-day leave, then had to uh, show up a certain date in... Uh, Oakland, California. What was that 30-day leave like? It was different. Uh, first time I've been home since I've been drafted. Uh, home, worked a little bit on the farm, and I'd also worked for the City of Heath Water Department uh, for a year prior to that, and uh, went and spent some time with the guys I worked with there, and uh, just ran around some of the guys I went to school with. Were you more cognizant at that point of the attitudes regarding the war? Uh, yes. Than you uh, had been in high school, I guess I should ask. Yes, because at uh, Columbia, South Carolina there, uh, when we went off uh, post, we were not allowed to wear our uh, fatigues. We had to wear our, our dress uniform because of uh, they didn't want anybody having any trouble with any civilians at that time. Okay. So when you got back to Millersport, what kind of reception did you have? Uh, again, it's a rural area. Uh, some of the people uh, who knew me, I uh, wondered where I'd been. They didn't know I'd been in basic training at IIT. Most of the people I went to school with was either way uh, finishing school which I, and, uh, or getting married or just uh, finding their way in life. Or some was also in the military also. Okay. So you had that 30-day time period. And then at the end of the 30 days, you've got to report to Oakland, California. Was yes. that correct? Yes. Why'd you go to Oakland? Uh, that was where I was to report uh, I think it was Fort Ord. Do you have any thoughts about not reporting? Uh, no. Okay. Why was that? Do you uh, think? I was dedicated to the government, uh, military patriotic. Okay. So you report to Fort Ord. What happens then? Uh, it's been there about three or four days, getting uh, it, it filling out the paperwork and so forth. And uh, one night we're taken to Travis Air Force Base, put on an airplane, fly to. Uh, South Vietnam, by the way, of uh, Alaska and Japan. 
would you take with you? Basically, just the uh, basic equipment, some uh, uh, jungle fatigues that have been issued to us. At Fort Ord? At Fort Ord. Okay. What else? That was basically it. Any weapon? No, that would be issued once we got to our new unit. So you got one change of clothes? or I believe it was at that time it was one change of clothes, yes. How many pair of underwear and socks? Uh, a couple pairs. Okay. Helmet? No, none of that until we got to okay. South Vietnam. Okay. Where did you arrive in South Vietnam? Uh, I forget the uh, airport, but it was around the Benoit. Do you remember what date that was? I'm thinking the 7th of uh, September, I believe. Okay. And at that point, you're assigned to the 1st Division? Yes. Did you know anything about the 1st Division before you arrived? No, not at that time. Um, what did you subsequently learn about the 1st Division? It was a very proud division. It had a lot of background history uh, to be proud of. Uh, they took care of their men. Uh, they, the work that they did uh, was very diligent. They uh, paid attention to detail. How did you learn about the, you, you mentioned the history of the division. How did you learn about that? Uh, through information that the soldiers I was with passed down, also that they had the a unit, uh, newspaper that they put out in division newspaper that they put out, and they always always put a little bit of history in those uh, newspapers. Okay, were there specifics that you knew about the first division, and if so, what were they? Not until I got there, no. Okay. Do you know, for instance, how long the first division had been in existence? Well, the first division was uh, uh, developed during World War One. As the uh, first division uh, started over in uh, Europe, and you learned that while you were serving in Vietnam. Yes. Okay. And you learned about subsequent service of the division in World War Two. Yes. And in uh, Europe and Germany. Yes. Okay. So you're there. You're in country. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Well, I'm in our rear area. I get shipped to uh, Lai K, which I joined the. Company area there in the city of Lai Kay. And uh, our, my company is out in the field at that time. And I spend about two days there getting involved. What into company was that? I'm company sorry. Company D, first and the 26th, okay. uh, double blue spaders. Okay. And uh, getting indoctrinated by the uh, company uh, assistant commander. And uh, then after being indoctrinated and getting, make sure they have all my equipment and so forth. And, uh, make sure I have enough magazines for ammo and various other equipment that I need. Uh, they then fly me out to, uh, by helicopter, out to uh, fire, support, fire support base Thunder. And I spend about uh, two days there, and then uh, uh, there's a resupply shipment going out to the company, uh, Company D, and I go out with that uh, resupply, and that with that process there, they're also taking out a hot meal to them in Mermite cans. So I go out with that supply and get dropped off with the company at that time. At that time, I'm also assigned to my squad, which was a Trigger 2 element. How big is a squad? At that time, I believe there was 10 of us in the squad. And the squad is part of a uh, pl platoon. platoon, which is how many? Uh, 20 to 24 people at that time. And a platoon is part of a? Uh, usually three to four platoons make a company. So you've been assigned out here. You've kind of just been taken out and dropped in the middle of Vietnam. Yes. What was your first impression? Let me ask you this. What was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there from Fort Ord? Getting off the airplane, uh, when you got to the doorway, you had this uh, sudden impact of uh, warm heat air hitting you in the face and uh, almost knocked you back into the airplane. It was that much different than what we were accustomed to. That was the first impact. And then the impact of uh, the people in the different, uh, how they lived, the different type of buildings that was uh, around and so forth. How much interaction did you have with the Vietnamese people at that time? Uh, initially, very little. Uh, I was in a company area there in Lai K. Uh, we had some reactions. Some of the people that was employed were the Vietnamese, and you got a chance to talk to them in the company area. What were your impressions of them? Uh, they seemed to be very nice and very uh, hardworking. Okay. In what capacities would they be working? Uh, 
help cleaning up the various uh, buildings, uh, help keeping the company area clean, uh, maybe doing a little maintenance on various parts of the mm -hmm. compound. Okay. So you're there in Lake High for how many days did you say? Uh, I think it was uh, like maybe three or four initially. Okay. And then you were shipped out. Yeah, flown out to, uh, to the fire, fire support, support base. base Thunder. What was the date that you arrived in Vietnam? Do you remember? I'm thinking it was around the 8th or 9th of uh, September. It could have been the 7th, I don't recall at that time. Okay. So you're out to the fire support base. By the way, what, does, what do you mean when you say, I was indoctrinated by the assistant company commander? Basically, the uh, procedures that the company uh, followed, like out in the field, what would happen in these certain circumstances in a firefight, or uh, uh, how you load and unload from a helicopter, uh, just the, the basic things to survive out in the field. So really you're receiving training above and beyond what you received in AIT? Yes. Is it more specific to the function there in the jungle? Yes, it's more what you need to survive. Okay. What you need to carry, not carry. Such as? Uh, we did not carry a... Uh, mine went blank here for a second. Uh, there's a number of equipment you did not need to carry. One was a protecting mask for chemical warfare. Was that standard issue? It was standard issue. And so they just said, pitch this? Yes. You might keep the container to hold letters whatnot in, but most people pitch that also. Okay. Uh, when you got to the field, uh, you would each, uh, so many C rations that you necessarily did not carry all the C rations you were given. You, would, uh, you knew you were going to be resupplied in three days. You would take the see rations that you would eat during those three days and open up and destroy the remainder of the ones you would not eat. Okay, why? Out in the field, uh, you did not want the enemy to recover these and use them for their purposes. So by opening them up and everybody putting them in the pile and use them before we left, we'd burn the cardboard up along with the sea rations. It would destroy the food content okay. of the sea rations. Okay, so you get rid of your excess sea rations. Right. You get rid of your gas mask. Yeah. What else? Uh, Basically, the only clothing that you had was the clothing you wore, and that was a shirt and pair of pants and socks and boots and hat. Take changes of underwear, socks, no, anything I, like that? Under, underwear would rot off of you. Okay. Uh, you didn't wear a T-shirt or underwear. You had maybe a, a towel you wore around your neck for uh, help uh, clean or... Or if your shirt rot off of you while he's out in the field before you get uh, repaired, you could make it into like a, kind of slid in and make it into like a shirt. The towel? Yeah, green towel, yes. Did you ever have a shirt rot off of you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Well, usually if I was the point man, uh, usually in our, in our battalion, they try to rotate the various companies back to the fire support base every uh, eight to nine days. And sometimes the situation would come up where we'd be out in the field a lot longer than that. During the rainy season, especially being a point man, we didn't follow any trails. We made our own trails. And through the, the uh, wetness of the terrain in, ju in the jungle and the brush pulling at your clothes and so forth, between rotting and shredding your clothes, it wouldn't take very long for you wouldn't have anything left. And these were heavy jungle fatigues. Jungle fatigues. Mm -hmm. What was the longest time you ever spent out in the field without returning to the fire base? Our company spent uh, 19 days in the field one time, and when uh, we had about 97 in our company in that time, and when we went to the, back to the fire support base, uh, over 80 of the guys had uh, jungle rot, uh, basically with their feet and whatnot, and we were delayed from going back out the field about another four or five days because of the ringworm and so forth we had, and uh, so basically we walked... Uh, around the fire support base in shorts so we could dry out and uh, no shoes and medication on it. And when we went back out in the field, only about 45 of us were able to go back out to the field when we did go back out. So when you say you had jungle rot, you had it on your feet? Feet and skin, yes. Everywhere? Everywhere. Groin, armpits? Yes, everywhere. Was that kind of uncomfortable? Uh, yes, it got sores and whatnot and they gave you medication to put on it. and Basically dry, drying out and staying out of the rain and just dry Dry conditions helped out quite a bit. But if you're out in the field in the monsoon season, it's rather hard to stay yes, dry. Yes, you're wet all the time. Okay. Let's get back here now. Okay. You're at the fire support base uh, Thunder. 
you've been indoctrinated in LACON. You're out at Fire Support Base Thunder. How many days are you there before you have to go out in the field? About three to four before I go out to the field. Like I said, as, uh, companies do it for a resupply. Uh, send it out by helicopter. Uh, I'm, I think I'm the only one being flown out by helicopter as far as uh, replacement. I'll take that back. There was one other gentleman going out with me. Is in my squad. His name was uh, Dennis Frickle from Montana. And uh, he had been wounded, and he was going back out to the squad I was going to be assigned to as a, uh, to fill back in. And us two, and all with the hot food, was going out. What was that helicopter ride like? It was an experience because I did not know what to expect or what, what, who was going to receive me on the other end. I didn't know what really to, where I was going for sure. I just knew it was uh, going to be a whole different experience. So when we came into a, a clearing on the LZ uh, to land to unload, I knew I had to get off immediately and help unload the equipment there. And I did not know who was going to meet me or what I was to do after that. Other than Frickle was with yes, you? Yes, Frickle. How did you feel? How, how long did the helicopter ride last? Probably about 20 minutes. Okay, once you arrive. In that 20 minutes, what emotions are you experiencing? A little bit of excitement, a little bit of scared, uh, anticipating the beauty of the country also. It's uh, a lot of greenery. You're passing over uh, new terrain, uh, trying to accept or get acquainted to what, what it's going to be like down there. And how old were you at this point? 19. 19 years old. Farm boy from Ohio. Yes. Okay. It takes you 20 minutes to get out there. It's very exciting. You unload. What happens? Met by the company commander. He introduces himself. And that's Who was that? Captain Moffat. Okay. Uh, he introduces me to the new platoon leader, who I do not remember the name at the time there. And he introduced me to the new uh, platoon sergeant, which is uh, Sergeant uh, Norm Grevo. And he introduces me to the new squad I'll be assigned to, and that's the Trigger 2 squad and uh, the several men that, uh, that are in the squad. And it just happens to be two or three of them are from Ohio, which works out. And so he kind of signs me to one of the uh, fellow soldiers from Ohio, which is Ray Pugh, lives here in Hilliard, Ohio. And uh, then he kind of takes me underneath his arm for the rest of the evening and make sure I have food to eat and uh, make sure I got the right ammo and make sure I get the magazines loaded up and uh, dressed proper and know where the equipment goes and how to pull guard that night and how to set out my claymores and that type of so forth. What do you mean, how to, how to set out claymores? Uh, claymores are? Claymore mines is a kind of an uh, individual self-defense uh, weapon that they use as a unit. You put out a number of them and it's, and, uh, it's a claymore. It's a little mine that you stick out that you can aim. It has about uh, several hundred BBs in it that is projected out and be exploded with a uh, uh, electrical cap and can be projected out in, uh, by C4. And you run a, a deck cord, or de not deck cord, but run an electrical wire out to it that you can hand. Uh, a deck cord would be a detonation cord? Yeah, cord? but we did not use deck cord to that. Okay. You, use, you use deck cord to size several of them together and uh, to set off at the same time. But uh, how you were trained to do it, uh, basically in the States, and how you actually did it in combat was two different ways. What was different? Uh, basically, in combat, you took it out, you placed it, aimed it, then you put your uh, blasting cap inside the claymore, then you took your wire and wired back to your position. You made one trip and that was it. Because you did not want to leave several paths back and forth. Why not? Uh, because that would give your position away if the enemy came upon it and could see your path. And when you say you went back to your position, what was what did your position okay. consist of? Each squad, if he slept in the company size area, each squad was assigned a position in a circular area. And uh, during that uh, squad, maybe main like two positions in that perimeter. And we usually aimed everywhere from uh, three to, depending how many people we had in your squad, three to five men usually in that squad. And uh, in that particular five man position or four man position, uh, you would rotate during the night pool and security at that position all night long. Okay, what did the position itself consist of? Uh, wherever you were set up, usually the main positions was maybe uh, have an ambush set up on the trail, uh, watching for the enemy. 
and the rest of it would be in a circle, would be watching your backside because you didn't know which way it was coming from. Did you dig in or? Uh, most cases, no, we did not. We tried to use the, the train to uh, hide our features, such as the trees or jungle or the bush, or to, to hide our location. You had uh, noise and light discipline. You didn't talk very much or you didn't, no lights of any type. No cigarettes? No, not, not after dark, no. Did you smoke cigarettes? No. no. Uh -uh. Okay. I just... When you set out the claymores, how many claymores would you set out? Usually everybody carried one, uh, depending on the situation. If you was in the company or squad size, everybody carried one. Sometimes later on, when we were out in six-man ambushes, we would carry more to have more of a firepower. But usually just one claymore. Each what individual. was the so purpose of the claymore? For defensive purposes to help protect your front. Okay. If you were setting up an ambush, and what we called a perfect ambush was, was when uh, if you had an enemy in your line of fire and ambush, you could blow all your claymores at one given time. It sounded like a uh, howitzer round coming in. And if you blew them off one time and you had all your enemy in that uh, kill zone that particular time and you didn't have to fire a shot, that was a perfect ambush because then the enemy didn't know if it was an artillery round that came in and did the job or if it was actually in a ambush where you had the enemy fighting against you or not. What was that first night like? It was uh, quite different. Uh, first thing I noticed was uh, out in the jungle it had a lot of uh, fluorescent uh, green out in there and couldn't figure out what that was to begin with is uh, because the it's old age rotten stuff out there evidently but it had a lot of fluorescent green stuff out there that showed up at night time. They had a uh, Lizard out there was kind of uh, made a loud noise at night time. It was uh, called a fuck you lizard. <laughs> but that's exactly what the noise they made. They real, at the loud, if you yell at it at the loud, top loud as you could, your voice, that's the way the lizard sounds. It was, uh, so that's why you guys named it that? Yeah, okay. yes. And that's just the way it sounded. That's just the call I had. But those are the first two things I learned at night time. Okay. Then you would pull, uh, like I said, uh, usually if it got dark, you would break down uh, the guard duty within your particular group that you're setting up with, usually, like I said, anywhere from three to six guys. And then uh, you might have to pull guard duty once or twice during the night, anywhere from, say, uh, half hour, 45 minutes, first time, to an hour. We tried not to go over an hour because we found out that if you went over an hour, guys had a tendency to fall asleep. So you pull uh, guard duty usually twice during the night, at the very least. And... Uh, so this is the same thing night after night. That On you, one, off three? Well, depending, depending how many there were. If there's only three of you, then he's only off two. <laughs> but if there's four or five, uh, like I said, the, you, depending what your rotation was, if you use the third one to pull uh, guard duty, uh, or, I mean, you all slept right within the hand reach of each other. Make sure it's your job to keep awake and listen for sounds and answer the radio. Uh, why is your turn? Uh, if you if you do number two, well, you might only get to sleep an hour before it's your turn to pull guard, and maybe four hours and you turn again, and maybe two hours and you get up again. Okay. So it was it was, uh, it was a different each night and how much sleep you got or didn't get. How much sleep did you get that first night? Wasn't too bad actually. I slept pretty good that first night after I got my turn to sleep. Okay. Because uh, I've always been a light sleeper, so it didn't okay. it didn't bother me that much. As it, the longer you were there, how much sleep did you get? What, what you found out after you was out in the field for a period of time, and everybody in our squad experienced this, you, start, you always had that worry of falling asleep on guard duty because you were woke up in the dark. And you always had a tendency uh, to fall asleep, but you didn't want to fall asleep. I mean, you played various games with your mind to stay awake. And... Because you couldn't move, you couldn't get up, stand up, you couldn't walk around. It's where you're sitting or laying at, this, and you don't move to, not to make noise. So what would happen was your buddies that were with you, ten, occasionally they would sit up thinking that they had fell asleep on guard duty. And they were worried that they fell asleep, and you, you knew exactly what they were going through because you did it yourself. So you'd reach over to touch them and say, go back to sleep, uh, I'm on duty, you know. Then they would go back to sleep. But this would happen maybe a couple of times a week. You would all of a sudden you'd wake up thinking you fell asleep on guard duty because you pulled it that much. Okay. When was the first time you saw actual combat? 
probably uh, a week after it got out into the field. Uh, I think we came upon the, I was at the point at that time, our, our squad wasn't leading, it was company size. Uh, the, we, our, our squad was, uh, or our, our platoon was second platoon back, and platoon ahead of us uh, came upon enemy soldiers and had a firefight and we killed several of them. What was that like the first time? Uh, didn't know what to expect, I was a little bit scared. Uh, the company commander made sure we all uh, viewed the bodies and so forth, uh, so we all would know what to expect in our mind. Who was we? The, the whole company. The whole company? The whole company. Not just the new guys? No, the whole company. How long had the rest of the company been out there? Uh, probably uh, probably a week okay. right after I went out. So it was still relatively new for them as well? Well, I mean, they'd been out off and on, but I mean, from their, coming in from the fire support base, okay. yes. And the company commander was again Captain, Captain Moffat. What did you think about Captain Moffat? He was great. He took care of his men. Men came first. He would do various things to uh, take care of us any way he could, make sure, make sure we came first, make sure we had food, water. Uh, one, one of the biggest things, I was in the uh, country three months before I got my first shower, uh, as far as one, it wasn't a rain shower or monsoon. Mm -hmm. But at that time, we was in fire support base, and uh, uh, got a five can uh, a five gallon water can, and I had a five gallon uh, bucket with a sprinkler on it, and hung up by a pole, and put the five gallon of water into the bucket and stood underneath it, and that was the shower. But uh, uh, that was the first shower I actually had. But anyway, out in the field, uh, we were working in an area where it was quite swampy, and the B 52s had dropped uh, thousand pound bombs in the area. And they'd made quite a few bomb craters, and the craters would maybe be 20 or 30 feet across, maybe 10 or 15 feet deep. And we was working in an area where the water is about waist deep, crystal clear. And the uh, company commander, uh, it's his job to call back to battalion and give them our location every 100 yards when we moved. And he kept delaying a little bit, and we was actually ahead of where we were supposed to be. And so uh, we broke out in the... Uh, I had a swimming party. We put out security and had a little swimming party and took took baths that afternoon, you might say. And that was Captain Moffat's idea? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So it, it helped with the morale a little bit. In the, okay. in the, I mean, every, everything was secure and whatnot. It just wasn't according to oil. Let's go back to this first combat experience that you had. How long did it last? Probably 10 or 15 minutes at the max. What do you remember doing? Or do you remember doing? Hitting the ground, staying low. Uh, I didn't fire. I didn't, Maybe fired a couple of rounds out because I, uh, my uh, platoon sergeant was right beside of me, and I followed his instructions for the fire and so forth. Okay. But I remember I hit the ground st and stayed very low, along okay. with everybody else. And at the end of the 15 minutes, what were your thoughts when Captain Moffat had you view the dead Vietnamese body? Uh, like I said, I was a little bit scared because the first uh, dead body I'd seen like that. I didn't know what to think until I'd actually seen it and, and uh, what to accept and so forth. Did you have casualties? No, not this particular time, no. You had casualties subsequent to that in other actions, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, did you have friends, partners, comrades wounded? Uh, yes. Uh, after that, uh, one time uh, when we went to fire support base, uh, during the day they took us out on a little, another little mission, and we was working with uh, armed personnel carriers. Was this, I'm sorry, the same day? No, this was uh, okay. about uh, three or four weeks later. Okay. And uh, we was in a kind of a uh, high growed up area, and uh, they put us in front of, they moved us uh, from behind the APCs to put us in front of the APCs and uh, to sweep through this area, and it was a highly uh, area that was, uh, had a lot of booby traps in. And when we went to move around this uh, APCs, one of the guys in front of us hit a booby trap, and four of the five guys I was with got wounded. By? Bo booby traps. Was it an explosion, punji sticks? Yeah, two, two of them, uh, explosions. And so we had to pull back and uh, call in for a dust off. And, uh, dust off is? A helicopter coming in to uh, take uh, in the individual wounded people out to the hospitals. How badly were they wounded? Uh, 
most of those just shrapnel. Uh, like a couple of muscles and fingers, and, and most of those just uh, leg wounds and stuff like that. How did that experience affect you? By that time, uh, been around enough enough of that type of stuff that uh, minor wounds, you really didn't think that much about it. You you helped them, you bandaged them up, and you got the medic there, and you helped them and tar carry them off the helicopter. What about the first time you saw a fellow American killed in combat? How did that affect you? Uh, Do you remember it? Yes, it was real bad. It was, uh, it was probably after this period of time. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I did not think uh, I was with the 1st Division at that time. I was with the 101st at the time when I first seen the out in the field and seen the first uh, American killed. What were the circumstances? I was after they pulled colors of the 1st Infantry Division out. Uh, the unit I was sent to was the 101st, and we was working outside at Camp Evans out in the mountains up by the DMZ, and uh, uh, it was out on eight-man patrol recon, and uh, I was RTO. RTO. Uh, radio telephone operator, and uh, I was third man in our squad back, and we was going to get water that particular day. And we was on mountainside, and we was on a recondo group, and we were only supposed to be out there a day, and this is our third day, and we've been day without water. So uh, our first individual, I was third man going down the hillside, and uh, the North Vietnamese had us cornered in, and they opened us up on us with RPGs. Rocket-propelled grenades? Yes. And uh, uh, our point man at that time was uh, hit with one, and we had to fall back and pull him back and call for uh, gun chip reinforcement. How did that affect you? Uh, pretty bad time. We did all the guys at the time because he was a pretty good friend of everybody with us there. Do you remember his name? David Huberty from Minnesota. How did you feel about it? Uh, very bad. He was a close friend and uh, just uh, upset quite a bit. How did you react? Uh, basically at that time we was fighting for our lives so it's didn't have time to re reflect at that time there. We were just trying to save the rest of us. Did you have time to reflect later on? Yes. It was uh, when uh, we finally got there uh, later on that day, uh, went back to our compound. Uh, we talked back and forth to each other and tried to support each other. We had memorial service to uh, for him and so forth to help some point. Okay. Let's go back now, jump back a little bit. You're back with the 1st Division. We're back with your first time out. Um, at some point, you end up becoming a point man. Yes, that's probably about the, the second week out. Uh, prior to that, we had a, our point man was uh, Mike Smith in our uh, squad. And I was uh, second right behind him being trained to be point man. Uh, Mike Smith was from uh, Iowa, Bloomfield, Iowa. And... Uh, he was point, he'd been a point man for quite a while. He was due to uh, uh, go into another area, so I was being trained to replace him. And so he basically taught me everything that he knew. And then at that, uh, after a couple of weeks of that, I replaced him and became a point man. What did the training consist of? Basically, uh, paying very close attention to your instincts, paying close attention to what's out in front of you, listening, uh, be very quiet, voice discipline. Uh, don't be in a big hurry to go somewhere. Why if, not? Uh, that's when you get into booby traps. Don't follow any trails. Uh, if in question, don't be afraid to hesitate and, and call up for advice and so forth. Okay. And it took two or three weeks of training with this? Yes. What was the life expectancy for a point man? Uh, I think they said around a month, month and a half. How long did you serve as a point man? About uh, three months. So about three times the normal. Yes. What was that like? To a certain degree, it was exhilarating. Uh, you had to be even keel. You couldn't get excited too easy. Uh, it, was a, it was a different experience. You knew what was going on. You knew what was going on more than almost anybody, including the company commander, because you first to see things or know what's going on. So where to be the platoon sergeant or platoon leader or company commander that is all the time asking, uh, you know, what your opinion was of things up there because you were the first to feel or see or, or react to something. But again, 
you were no stronger than you were the squad behind you. Because if you've seen something or had problems up there, is how quickly they reacted that saved your life in most cases. For example, if you've seen the enemy, you want to make sure you didn't move into their uh, ambushes or whatever, but if you've seen the enemy coming and you let them know, then your M60 machine gun team, they would be right up beside of you immediately to help put down the fire suppress uh, attack. How would you let them know? Uh, usually by hitting the ground first. As soon as they see me go down, they'd go down also and be right up there. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, everybody's watching everybody. You don't make too much sound out there. You don't yell too much. Initially, it's a noise and light discipline, but uh, usually it's reaction. If you're not using trails, mm -hmm. how is it that you're able to move through the jungle? You break your own trail. You make your own trail. How? Uh, by moving in and around through the brush. Sometimes you're crawling. Sometimes you're uh, weave, weaving in and around through the, the various types of uh, bamboo and so forth. Okay. And sometimes it's so thick you only can crawl through it. So it's you and four or five other guys in your squad. You're the point man. Mm -hmm. You're moving like forward. Said, usually the squad, there's 12 of us, so we break down two okay. teams in the squad. What weaponry would you be carrying typically? Uh, as a point man, I'd have an M16 with me. And the person immediately behind me had an M79 grenade launcher. Or uh, uh, he carried also a, a buckshot pipe around in that also. So if I hit the ground... So it's like, like a, a big shotgun. shotgun. Yeah, it's like I hit the ground and he'd be firing that right over my head. Okay. So immediately behind him was then probably the uh, uh, squad leader or uh, RTO, radio telephone operator. Okay. Did somebody usually have a machine gun? Yeah, they followed in right behind the usually the RTO. What size machine gun? M60 machine gun. So the RTO is carrying the radio and the machine no, gun? No, the RTO is carrying the radio and the M or, uh, M16. Then be the squad leader, or vice versa there, and then right behind them be the M60 machine gunner, be about the, the fifth or sixth guy back. Okay, so you're carrying the M16, mm -hmm. which weighs what, 12 pounds? No, not that much. I think uh, six or eight pounds. So. Six or eight pounds, and your personal belongings. What yes. else are you carrying? Uh, your poncho liner, uh, your extra ammo, uh, maybe uh, three or four grenades. Couple of smoke grenades, uh, gallon, gallon and a half of water. Okay. What's the total weight that you're carrying? As a point man, you want it very little because you uh, helped uh, not give off the sound. So you would carry maybe more than uh, 15, 16 magazines. Uh, you would uh, carry uh, no more sea rations than you had to. Uh, so you carry the minimum amount of sea rations with you. And uh, usually you carry a lot of crackers and maybe uh, cigarettes came with your sea rations. And, and I didn't smoke, but they came about uh, four or five cigarettes in a pack. But I carried the cigarettes with me because they were light to carry. And I know later on I could trade them off for food with the guys that did smoke because they'd done smoked all their cigarettes for that time. So you were a prudent man. Everybody was, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Why do you say everybody was? You had to learn to survive out in the jungle to uh, be able to survive. You had to, you had to learn to watch what you carried, watch what you did. Yes. Okay. And one of those things was learning that you could use yeah, what you could cigarettes use. as barter goods. Yes. What you used, what you couldn't use. Okay. Approximately how much weight are you carrying? As a point man, uh, Maybe 50 pounds. Okay. How much did you weigh? When I first went to Vietnam, I weighed 175 pounds. Uh, when I came back, I weighed 125. You lost 50 pounds in Vietnam? Yes. Okay. You mentioned that you had some significant uh, combat October 20th, 1969. What was that? We were out on a six-man ambush on a clearing and uh, some enemy soldiers uh, came across and we opened fire on the enemy soldiers and a helicopter came flying over with uh, one of the commanders in and the helicopter was uh, shot down and uh, at that time while we were still firing up on the enemy and uh, then we uh, 
was off to the left of the enemy a little bit, and uh, it was on fire. So a couple of us uh, moved over to uh, help, see if we could help with the individuals coming from the helicopter. So we moved over to help get the pilot and assist the pilot, and the commander was already out of the helicopter that was burning. And we laid down the field of fire while we was doing this. And you ran through enemy fire? Yeah, they were firing at us at the time, yes. To help them out? Yes. And you got them out. What did you do then? Uh, basically, they're interested in saving their lives and pulling them out and, like I said, laying down the field of fire so the other guys could assist in doing that. Uh, in the process of doing this, uh, most of the enemy got away from us on this. But your main goal was to save, the save those guys right. as That's opposed correct. to engaging the enemy. Yes. What made you do that? Well, they were they were our friends, our buddies. Why didn't you just consider your own safety first? They were one of us. We, we relied upon them as well as they relied upon us. And you were awarded a bronze star for your action yes. in, that, in that case. Now, you have an interesting theory about how and why the helicopter was shot down. What's your theory on that? There's a very good chance that uh, part of the rounds that they received was from the rounds that we were firing because uh, they came, the helicopter came very close to the, over the top of the people we were firing at. And very easily our rounds could have hit the ground and, and uh, re uh, reflected off the ground and hit the helicopter there. And so you think that maybe that's what happened? Yeah, maybe we shot the helicopter down. Okay. Did you realize that at the time, or did you? That's something we theorized on afterwards there. Okay. Um, and after talking with the pilot also. Okay. What did the pilot have to say about the situation? Uh, he was kind of ordered to fly that direction. In, uh, By the officer who was yes, with him? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, um, on November 30th, uh, you were ordered into Occupy an Enemy Bunker Complex. Well, Can you tell us about that experience? Yes. Uh, we were... Uh, our company was flown out of another uh, area into this uh, new area in South Vietnam where we were working out of, and we worked through our way through the jungle. We came upon a new enemy bunker complex, and it had about uh, 12 to 14 bunkers, freshly built bunkers in it. And so we uh, uh, moved in, occupied the bunker complex, and went through it and searched the underground through the tunnels and so forth see what was there and so forth, in the occupied area, waiting for the enemy to come back. And we stayed there that night, and the next day we received orders to, that we was to move out to the clearing, which was about a click away, which is a 1,000 meters. And uh, B Company was to be landed at the same time we were to be extracted. You were in what company? Uh, D Company, Delta Company. Okay, so they're coming in to replace you? I mean, replace us. And they needed an individual to lead B Company back into the enemy bunker complex. And uh, my uh, platoon leader, uh, Lieutenant uh, Wayne Johnson, uh, asked me if I would uh, do this, and uh, I said yes, I would. He volunteered before that. So uh, I led the company back in. They basically took the uh, majority of my equipment with them. They were going back into the fire support base, and as soon as the company reoccupied the uh, enemy bunker complex, I was to be flown back out to my regular company. So my, my squad took most of my gear with me. I just took the bare minimum of what I needed with me, a few magazines and smoke grenade and, and uh, some uh, grenades along that line and canteen along with the 16 there. So, uh, so uh, B Company landed and uh, D Company flew out, and I got with the company commander. And one of the last things uh, my platoon leader instructed me before I left it was not to be point man, uh, let their point man do the job, and I just advise them. And I Why? Said, okay. Why would he have given you that? It was a dangerous job going back in. It, it, uh, I was just there to guide them to where the bunker complex was. It was a dangerous job, and they didn't want me getting injured. What made it particularly dangerous? I mean, you were operating point. It was, it was, the, it was the enemy bunker complex, and the, you didn't want to take any more chances than you had to. I mean, it's just another chance of going was back. Was it still occupied? Uh, when we left, it wasn't occupied, but it could very easily have been. You, you just didn't know where the enemy was. Uh, As it turned out, it had been reoccupied yes, when you got back? Yes, yes. Uh, and going back in, 
and moving back in, uh, we back, back into the edge of it there, and we started moving through the bunker complex, and I was the uh, second man back, and uh, the point man was having a little bit of problem which direction to go, and uh, so I just moved up side and said, I'll, I'll lead you through. So I took two steps around him. About the time I took two steps around him, about the time the, uh, the fire opened up. And I was wounded along with him. He was hit five times. I was hit once. And uh, then uh, Company B moved up and, and took care of everything inside the bunker complex. And uh, within 20 minutes after we were wounded, we were in a uh, hospital in Lake A being, being operated on. You were evacuated by a helicopter? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where were you wounded? I was wounded in the left thigh. Okay. And you received a Purple Heart? Yes. Because of that wound? Yes. Were you ever wounded subsequent to that? Uh, just a little bit of shrapnel here and there and some other engagements. Uh, nothing for a Purple Heart, just minor stuff. And the other point man, did he survive? I do not know. I could not find his name anywhere where he was killed. But uh, they had taken him to an additional higher-up hospital because he had a couple of head wounds also. Okay. Um, you ever have any contact with the platoon leader who volunteered you back into that? Yes. Uh, here a few years ago, about five or six years ago, I was having knee replacement and laid up and it was a young computer. And I knew the names of my 10, 11 guys in my squad, so I started trying to see if I could locate them. And... Uh, uh, Lieutenant Wayne Johnson, I uh, found out, lived in Centennial, Colorado. And uh, it just happened that I was going to a uh, Lions convention there at, within a month or two of, uh, after finding him there. And so I met up with him out there, and we went, and he invited me to his house, and we had dinner, and met his wife and family and so forth. And one of the first questions he, he posed to me, if I had any, uh, well, the first thing is he wanted to apologize to me for sending me on that particular mission. He never had a chance really to talk with me after that, even though we got back together and said for the last 30-some years I had worried him that I, he had sent me on that mission, and uh, he felt bad about that. And I said, told him, don't worry about it. Uh, that's just one of the things that happened. But he never discussed that even after you got back in no, your unit? No, never had the chance to sit down and talk about that. And how long were you two around each other? Probably another uh, three or four months after that. So you had other combat experiences as well, yes. is that correct? Yes. Anything in particular about those that really stands out that's really you'd like to share? Well, in combat, a lot of, a lot of accidents can happen because people get excited. Uh, people throw grenades too short. People can get wounded that way. Uh, uh, just sometimes things don't appear like... Uh, like to do on the, the combat movies you see on TV. Uh, for example, we were, uh, you have these Chu Hoys, which are basically the enemy who have uh, surrendered and volunteered to take and lead you back into uh, various uh, areas to, uh, that they might know where there's enemy bunker complexes. And we were given this one Chu Hoy in our platoon one time, and we were to go through this bunker complex. And the two other uh, platoons in our company were used as blocking forces on various trails leading out, out of the, uh, this bunker complex area. And my platoon's job was to uh, assault the bunker complex. And uh, the Chihoy was with the company commander. Then he assigned him to one of the other platoons. Well, when we assaulted the bunker complex, it was right across the clearing, which is about 100 feet wide. And we had gotten each individual out in the field carried a law. And so we'd gotten all the laws from the other two platoons, so each individual... Okay, law, law's rocket. Right. So each uh, individual in our platoon had three laws. So we got online firing these laws across the clearing. So each, each individual in our platoon fired three laws where this uh, bunker complex was into the, across the clearing to this bunker complex. Then we assaulted this bunker complex in point man of my squad and the other point man of the other squad. We were lead elements going into this bunker complex. So you're low crawling through this bunker complex, and you got your, because uh, so, you don't know what to expect there, and where the enemy's located at. And so we're getting in there, and about halfway through it, all of a sudden, out to my right, I see this individual coming at me, this uh, Vietnamese coming at me with a grenade in his hand, and he's about 20 feet off. And all of a sudden, I'm ready to shoot him. I mean, uh, to me, he's the enemy. 
and I hadn't realized he's the Chu Hoy, and he's just working his way through the bunker complex. And probably a half a second later, I would have shot him, and I didn't shoot him. Here he was a friendly individual. That's just how close to come to shooting. Did you ever? How did you respond to that experience? It was uh, it taught me something. You know, just sometimes you got to be hesitant, to, so you don't shoot somebody that's friendly, injure somebody that's friendly. Do you ever shoot somebody who was not friendly? No. You don't ever remember no. having that experience? No. Okay. Eventually you got switched over to the 101st Airborne. Yes. How did you feel about that? Well, seven months you've been with uh, friends that you basically slept right beside of each night. Uh, you knew them better than you knew anybody in your life. Uh, because everything, you did everything together. We went to the movie, you went to the shower, you went to eat. Uh, you slept right beside each other every night, so you got to know them really well. Uh, so basically, everybody was going different directions, being sent different directions. So you were losing your friends. So in the process, you had to make, you had to make new friends. And then you had to go through all the in-processing of going into a new company. What did you think about the 101st when you went over there? I uh, didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I didn't really know what I was getting sent into. I got sent into a recondo unit, uh, what was called 3rd Bar Brigade Air Cavalry. And we had our own squadron of helicopters. We had a unit of about 50-some people. And it was our job to go out on the recondo and repel into uh, areas. And, and uh, we worked from anywhere from two to eight-man recondo groups. Went over, crossed the border some to do a little bit of recondo. And any helicopter shot down the I-Corps, it was our job to go out and recover also. Did you guys in the 1st Division have a name for 101st Airborne before you got there? Well, not before we got there, or after we got there. What, what was I, that? I think uh, some names, one of the names that was used was the 100th Worst. Why did, you, why did you use that? Because name? they had a tendency to not take care of their people. Like down at first, we were a little bit spoiled because the 1st Infantry Division took care of their people. What was different? Uh, up in the 101st, they seemed not to take care of the people as far as promotions or PR, or make sure they got breaks periodically. They seemed to put them out in the field and leave them out there, uh, which being a recondo group, we were had a little bit better, but uh, it just uh, it didn't seem like the soldier come first as far as taking care of. It doesn't matter. Okay. Right. okay, Ted. Um, let's go back to this term, Chu Hoi. What's your understanding of the meaning of that word? Okay, chu Hoi is usually a uh, Viet Cong out in the field, and it's somebody that maybe wants to surrender, come over to the South Vietnamese side, and usually they would surrender out in the field. Uh, the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force and American Air Force would drop pamphlets out into the, in the jungle, and they would call them Chu Hoi pamphlets. And uh, basically, it was uh, uh, they would uh, enemy would read these and it's propaganda for them to try to get them to surrender to us. And usually, they would hold up their hands and, and say Chu Hoi, Chu Hoi, and that means they wanted to come over to our side and be a Chu Hoi. In most cases. They were taken back and trained and, and uh, investigated. And then in some cases, they would be sent back out to the field and lead us into maybe the areas that they had been working in and take us back into their enemy bunker complexes and tell us where the locations were and so forth. How did you feel about the Chu Hoys? You really were, never knew how to really take them. You didn't know how far you could really trust them. You could only trust them to a certain degree because you didn't know they were setting you up for uh, an ambush, or maybe they just want a, a free meal somewhere and they turn on you. You just didn't really know, so you had to kind of just watch yourself and you're back on the field with them. So you question their motivation. Yes, yes. You mentioned an experience of one Chu Hoi finding a friend? Yes, we were uh, 
had Chu Hoy assigned with us to go out in this uh, area where this would be a bunker complex. And uh, we went out platoon size and, uh, or correction, company size. And the two other company, the platoons in our company was assigned for a blocking area in this uh, bunker complex area for trails leading out. And my platoon was to uh, assault this uh, bunker complex. And it was right across about a, a clearing about 100 feet wide. And we in turn uh, had uh, taken the law rockets from the other two platoons and we in turn fired theirs along with ours to assault this platoon, or, excuse me, assault this uh, bunker complex. So each man fired three rockets and we assaulted this uh, bunker complex with the point man's leading, which I was one of the, my squad and one of the other squad. And leading uh, through this bunker complex, uh, once we'd uh, moved through and uh, collected all the uh, material that's to be collected in there and made sure it was clear and clear to the enemy, uh, we'd come across this one uh, body that had been there for about uh, a month earlier. And uh, the Chu Hoi was telling us that that was his uh, friend that he had been with there earlier. And uh, then we turned around and told him, yeah, we were ones that blew the ambush on that that killed him on that. And he was a little bit uh, insecure being around us since that given time. How did you guys respond to him? Uh, our company commander took him to the side and and uh, along with the, uh, the eva uh, rear evaluator took care of the Chu Hoys that was with us at that time, interpreter, and uh, worked with him, talked with him, the game settled back down. And, and uh, then uh, na later the next day, they brought a helicopter out and they were evacuated out of the field. Did you guys do anything with that body? Uh, we went and buried it for him, uh, uh, showing him in kindness and so forth. Was that normal procedure? No, usually the enemy, we left them lay where they were killed. Did you ever come across American bodies? Uh, in the 101st, uh, as part of our job sometimes to go out and uh, uh, secure bodies that were left behind by other units. you ever see evidence of uh, mistreatment of the bodies? Uh, yeah, in some cases. They were maybe uh, uh, tore up a little more than needed to be. How did that make you feel? Uh, Kind of nauseated and uh, mad. What do you mean, torn up a little bit more? Uh, they may be in more pieces. Maybe they threw an extra grenade or two that they need, didn't need to, or fired into them a little bit more than they needed to. You think after they were dead? Uh, in some cases, hopefully, yes. Did you ever see that kind of behavior by any Americans toward Vietnamese bodies? No. There apparently was not a lot of love lost between you and the 101st when you first got there. Did you ever experience any discrimination against you by the gentleman in the 101st? Well, I don't think it's individual upon individual. I think it was like uh, maybe 101st against the 1st Infantry Division. Uh, the unit that I went in with was 12 of us from the 1st Infantry Division that went into the 101st. And basically, uh, they tried to treat us as if we were brand new soldiers coming into the Vietnam. Uh, most of us had been in the country at least seven months, in some cases eight. And they tried to take, they took us to the new in country training. And the people that had instructing us had only been in the country maybe three months. So we would ask them questions that we knew from our own combat experience, and they wouldn't be able to answer that question. So that kind of wore on them a little bit. And they didn't like that. So they, a sense to uh, do details rather than going through the in-country processing. What might be an example of a question that you uh, would ask? What, what they would do them. underneath a certain combat situation, uh, a certain type of ambush, uh, some some type of things wouldn't really have a good question answer for it. They just had to play it by ear depending upon the situation. And some instructors, for example, would have this experience. And uh, a new person coming in the country wouldn't know to ask this type of question. Would these instructors outrank you? No. Uh -uh. Okay. No, they were mostly E4s, E5s, got early out from out of position out of the field somewhere. And at this point, you were what rank? Uh, E4. And e had you been promoted since you had been in Vietnam? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many times? Uh, as a PFC going over, and E4 was the second rank. Okay. I was just getting enough time to grade, get promoted to the next grade. Okay. And then you were over to the uh, 101st. Did you ever feel any other kind of discrimination against uh, yes, the guys from the 1st Infantry Division, uh, they wouldn't, uh, 
they wouldn't put us on the equal ranking as regarding R and R. They tried to treat us uh, as if we just come in country for R and R, uh, which usually most guys around eight or nine months was their time came up so, they, so that he go in R and R. They don't want to treat us as if they just come in the country and that's just our first month or two. And also for promotions, uh, they didn't want to promote anybody from the first infantry division. So uh, we had we had to file complaints with the IG to get on equal footing with the 101st people. With the who? With the uh, uh, inspecting general. Okay. So conceivably, you would have gotten no R and R had you not filed this complaint the whole 12 months you were in Vietnam. Yes. Okay. So you got your R and R. What'd you do on R and R? I went to Australia, Sydney, Australia. How long were you there? Seven days. What was that like? Good experience. Uh, flew from uh, flew on Pan Am from uh, Da Nang to uh, uh, Sydney, Australia. What'd you do in Australia? Uh, basically, they had uh, in processing there, and uh, you could uh, go to various hotels and pay your weekly rate, and had various uh, functions for you to. Uh, uh, visit, or you go. You're out. You're out. You know. You go to zoos, or you go uh, various uh, nightclubs, or, for example, they had a place there called Whiskey Go Go, and uh, uh, it was uh, entertaining there at nighttime. There, it was full what American. What sort of entertainment? It was owned by an American company. Uh, they seemed to get a lot of fights in there at nighttime. Okay. They had a lot of drinking, but this same place also had uh, uh, spatially things that you could do during the day, and uh, one of them was uh, Sydney, Australia, has the largest natural harbor in the world. And they had these harbor cruises, and they had these yachts. You could uh, you pay twenty dollars, and uh, they they come pick you up at your hotel, and they took you out in this yacht. And it might be uh, eight to ten guys on there, and for each guy, there's a girl there uh, to be with. And uh, you had a glass; it was never empty. You were out all day. They took you out to an island. You ate out on a uh, had a uh, island there. Had a, a cookout. You come back, uh, back in about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they took you back to your hotel, they picked you up at 6 o'clock in, took you down to Whiskey Go Go, and uh, like I said, your, your, your cup was never empty, and that was all for 20 bucks. That was well worth the money. <laughs> um, what were you thinking on the trip back to Vietnam? You wanted to get back there and get your time in, get your year, full year in, and get, go home. So you would have had, what, another four or five months at I that had point? another three months when I got back. I went in July, June, July, I think, June. Did you notice any change in your motivation the closer you got to your home date? Uh, yeah, you, you watched yourself a little bit closer. You didn't want to do anything foolish. Uh, Why? Uh, where you might get wounded a little bit easier, get a little bit more difficult combat than you need to be. I was last uh, month and a half I was there. I got a, I was able to get a rear job, and uh, I worked for Brigade S two and S three, and uh, I had a Brigade commander. Not cor correction on that. Had a Brigade S three officer that was uh, from Hawaii, and. Uh, he went down to Hawaii quite a bit, and uh, we go down there. I drive down. We go to MACV headquarters, military advisory command down there, get information, pass on information, and come back. And occasionally, he had me take the information down there on my own in the city of Hawaii. But uh, then he wanted to get a uh, higher command and uh, various awards. And uh, the brigade commander told him to, to in order to do that, uh, he'd have to spend some time out in the field in a fire support base. So. Uh, he did that, but he wanted to live like he was living in the rear out there, so he had me bring, fly out there every day and bring him out to starch fatigues and several cases of beer and pop each day, which firing out fire support base wasn't a favorite hobby to do. So I did that each day. And then uh, when he, after he got that position fulfilled, after he was out there a couple of weeks, he came back and he, got, he was given a brigade command. And he'd asked me if I wanted to uh, extend my enlistment there and stay with him for another six months. And I said, no, I wasn't that foolish. Uh, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> so you're flying starched fatigues out every day to this man, and he's got soldiers whose clothes are rotting on their back? Well, out at the fire support base up in the mountains wasn't quite that okay. bad, but they were dirty. 
Okay. And he's got beer and pop. Yeah, he uses he gives it to the soldiers, okay. but not yeah, it's not just for him. But okay. he's using it for soldiers out there. Okay. What was the difference between you, you mentioned in the hundred and first you were closer to the DMZ? What uh, was the difference in the environment there? Okay, we were working in the mountains up around the hundred and first and close to, uh, over on the edge of layoffs and so forth, up around DMZ. Uh, the people were a little more uh, aggressive up there. They were not as friendly as far as the civilians. Uh, the soldier he was fighting was more the North Vietnamese soldier, army soldier, and you felt you were more outnumbered up there uh, than the than American soldiers. You had more North Vietnamese than you had American soldiers. Did you notice a difference between a North Vietnamese soldier and the VC? Yes, the uh, North Vietnamese soldier was a lot more better trained, a lot more aggressive, uh, mainly a lot more aggressive. Better yeah. armed? Better armed up there because it's closer to the home ground. He used to get uh, supplies down there a lot quicker. Better supplied, I assume? Yes. Up there in the uh, mountains, you had your wet season, non-wet season. In the wet season, uh, clouds would move in, and an American soldier couldn't get resupplied because there wasn't any roads out there. Everything was flown in. Where the uh, uh, North Vietnamese, they had their trails and everything was brought in. Uh, they, their resupply was standard year-round, where the... the uh, American soldier, his fire support bases, after a certain period of time up there during the rainy season, they would pull the fire support bases out because they couldn't resupply them because of the clouds. In the rainy season, how, how did you sleep? Uh, in the 1st Infantry Division, uh, the area is fairly flat area where we worked in. Uh, you could set your clocks in the evening uh, by the time it started raining, uh, about dusk or uh, you, everything dried out right before you got ready to get dark and so forth and about time yeah, everything dried out it would start raining and so you'd be soaked and wet and cold for the rest of the night uh, like I said if in fighting positions you slept in usually anywhere from three to five guys all within a hand touch to where you laid at and it was your job to make sure they uh, didn't snore or give your position away and make sure they didn't get buried in the water too much because sometimes you'd be sleeping in five, six inches of the water. Do you guys have any protective equipment to help you with that water? Uh, basically, you had what you had on your back. Uh, you had a poncho liner, and then with that poncho liner, it's a, it's a very light piece of cloth uh, that would dry very easily out after the sun came out. But uh, what we would buy is a piece of what we call a Vietnamese plastic. It's very rubberized plastic that would not give off sound. You had another name for that. A uh, gook plastic. Gook plastic. And uh, uh, then we would tie that on to the outer shell of the uh, poncho liner. And that one turn would uh, help hold the body heat inside your body to help keep you fairly warmer during the night. It would keep you warm, but to keep you so you wouldn't uh, freeze to death. So you're trying to prevent hypothermia? Yes, yes. Okay. Any other advantages to that gook suit? Uh, not really. <laughs> it's noise? Just, uh, yeah, no, noise uh, helped with noise quite a bit. It wasn't noisy to carry around. The American poncho uh, gave off excessive noise out in the jungle. The, uh, the, the uh, gook plastic there that you wrapped on the outside of your poncho liner, it was uh, more rubberized, and it gave off a lot less noise. When, you, when did you leave Vietnam? In September 1970. Okay. I think it was September 7th, I believe. How did you feel? Uh, most exciting feeling I had when the airplane was taking off. I had the number one boarding pass on my particular flight. And uh, I remember there was, I forget how many boarding passes on, but anyway, when they brought the aircraft in to take off, uh, well, prior to that, they had you in a holding, you went through a process, out processing, and they had you in a holding pen. So when the aircraft came in, they could load you on a bus, take you right to that aircraft and load you on, the aircraft was on the ground less than 45 minutes. So when we got ready to go, somehow or another we had one more person on our aircraft that had seats. And here, here we wanted, somebody had infiltrated our group and wasn't to be on there. Here's somebody from the Air Force. So they had to threaten to unload everybody and the plane go off without anybody on it. That person finally stepped up and got off. But when we took off, that was the most exhilarating, uh, exhilarating uh, feel I ever had. And you came back to, where did you land? Fort Lewis, Washington. What kind of reception did you receive? Very poor. Uh, the soldiers there, we got, 
We left at, uh, Vietnam at uh, 11 p.m. at night time on, I uh, say, September the 7th. Uh, stopped at uh, Japan for about an hour, uh, then flew on to Fort Lewis, Washington. Got back at 11.45 the same day at the date line. Uh, it was 11.45 p.m. in Fort Lewis, Washington. Did go in through the end processing. Uh, as soon as we got off the airplane, the people there receiving us, the soldiers and so forth, uh, started cussing us and so forth and treating us so, a few cuss words and saying, where well, you think you are in Vietnam, use that type of thing with us. So, Why did they do that? Uh, we had no idea. We just we were just glad to be back. They could have said anything they wanted to. We were just glad to be back. So then uh, the end processing was very well uh, done after that uh, we had to go in and listen to a recruiting speech to see if we wanted to extend our uh, enlistment. Naturally, nobody wanted to do that. Uh, we all got a brand new set of uh, dress greens, which they went and fitted us and cut it to fit our size and put the proper ribbons and everything on. And uh, like I said, this and also got a steak dinner or steak meal that particular time. One of the things uh, for the previous year, you really hadn't had to have, need to have money that much. So twenty dollars a month, most twenty dollars a month in most cases got you through the month. And uh, so you really didn't need money. So when you came to the United States, it didn't dawn, you need money to get home. So you had, in most cases, had to get an advance payment of uh, money to, uh, so you could buy an airline ticket to fly home on. Didn't you have back pay due to you? Uh, it was in the bank, but you didn't have that access to it. Okay. Why was that? Uh, it was just the way it was, the military was set up at the time there. Okay. You just, uh, okay. You, you just. How long was it before you got back to Millersport? Uh, like I said, we landed there at 11.45, Fort Lewis Fortune, 11.45. I was on aircraft and out of uh, Fort Lewis at 6.45 in the morning. And that evening, I was back in Millersport that evening. Flew from Fort, Fort Lewis, Lewis to, to uh, St. Louis to Millers Columbus, Ohio to Millersport. How did you get to Millersport? Uh, my parents met me at the airport there in Columbus. What was that like? Uh, very exciting. I had my two brothers and sisters and both my parents spent me there. What was your mom's thought about you going off to the army? Uh, you left? Not very well. She didn't like it very well. She was uh, always worried. So forth. both parents were. Your dad? Mm -hmm. Yes. Had your dad served in the military? No. Uh -uh. Okay. No, he. They graduated in 1946, right after World War II. Oh. Okay. Um, You get a great reception from mom and dad. You go home. How were you received in Millersport? Uh, basically, I lived out in the country. The neighbors all came to congratulate me for being home. Uh, over in town, there ran into several people I knew, and they wanted to know where I'd been for the previous year. Or where, they hadn't seen me around for a while. just wanted to know where I'd been. That's basically how a lot of them perceived it. Did you have any problems fitting back in? No, I was very fortunate uh, where I worked at the previous year for City Heath, uh, the guys I had worked with, uh, the three or four, they were all prior veterans to former military time. And uh, I still had six months to do in the military, but even when I was home on leave there, they let me come up there and work with them a few days, and, and uh, I'd fit right in and whatnot, and they, they knew how to take care of me and so forth, watch over me. You run into any of your buddies from high school? A uh, couple of them, most of them were either way in the service that were still in the service and most of the others moved away and been married and so forth, not too many. As you began to run into them occasionally, did you notice anything different about them? Most of the guys who did not serve kind of avoided you a little bit. Uh, they were kind of, didn't know how to take you, didn't know how to be around you. Some of them were ashamed, I think. Some oh. of them were just ashamed because they didn't serve in the service and or maybe because they avoided the draft one way or another. And some of them were just the opposite? Mm -hmm. In what respect? Uh, a little bit aggressive and kind of downgraded you for being in the military. And How did that make you feel? I just kind of avoided them and stayed away from them. Have you run into any of those people subsequently through the years? Uh, no, I just basically avoided them and stayed away from them. I think they've, they've avoided me. In, in what respect? Respect? Were they disrespectful to you? They're bad mouthing and, and uh, uh, trying to take advantage of you, maybe in a situation uh, where, where it'd be uh, 
maybe an organization or something like that. Uh, like what? Running for office or something along that line there. Like what? Uh, they'd try. They'd have a little more experience doing this or that. Uh, in something, you know, they, uh, bad mouth military. The military is not any experience, so that doesn't really count. Just things on that line there. I see. So they belittled your military experience. Yes. And discounted it. Yes. Okay. You were in the Ohio National Guard. Yes. For a period of time. Yes, 1974. A buddy of mine taught me and joined the Ohio National Guard. And at that time, the majority of the Guard were people who were in the Guard to avoid the draft. And you had been in the regular military? Yes. What was the difference between those groups of people? Uh, at the time, the National Guard as a whole wasn't as well trained as it is today. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the people who were in the Guard were there getting their, further in their uh, education in college and so forth, and were there just basically so they couldn't get, wouldn't get drafted. And they were, weren't, uh, their training was one weekend a month and two weeks summer camp and wasn't in depth as it is, t as it is today. Like I said, uh, uh, most, a lot of them were there just to avoid the draft. Was, a number of them were dedicated, but a lot of them weren't. How long did you serve in the Guard? Uh, 19 years. Did you notice any changes in the Guard in that time period? Yes, quite a few changes. Uh, during the uh, latter 70s in the Guard, uh, especially here in Ohio, uh, they were not used to uh, recruiting. And when they'd done away with the draft and went to the all-volunteer army, uh, that eliminated the recruitment into the Guard because people were not enlisting into the Guard to avoid the draft. So the National Guard had to learn how to recruit again. So I know in our unit we came up with several programs, and one of them was here in the city of Columbus, for example, of going around to the high schools and, and recruiting in the high schools. And I was a, a member of our team in our uh, unit to do that. And the greater majority of schools at that time, we got kicked out of. We were going around in uniform. We were not allowed to go in uniform uh, to recruit because that was a no-no at the time because of anti-military feelings. This would have been how long after Kent State? Uh, probably four or five years. Did you experience any other sorts of negative treatment uh, relating to, or did, I should ask it this way, did the Kent State occurrence have any impact on your guard? Uh, no, no, because uh, I was over in Vietnam when that occurred, okay. I think, and uh, what, what uh, the negative side of it was is that the soldiers were not that well trained. And like I said, the majority of the soldiers at that time were the ones in the National Guard were the ones that tried to avoid the draft to further their education to begin with. And they, they just lacked the training to in the fields that they were doing because the money was all being spent towards the war instead of the, towards the training. Do you think that the Kent State occurrence had any effect on the way people viewed you in the National Guard? Probably some yeah, at that time there because... Uh, they were just starting to correct some of the problems that came because of that, because of the lack of training. Uh, they, people were not trained for riot control training. Uh, in the regular military, we were uh, trained for riot control training, so when we came into the Guard, we brought some of this experience along, and we were able to train our troops along with additional emphasis that the, the Ohio put on the training for riot control. So there was a greater degree of discipline? Yes. Do you have any, after the war, did you ever notice any issues with stress? So things happened I didn't understand until just a few years ago. Uh, before uh, getting drafted, I attended Otterbein College and found I couldn't afford that as well, so I attended the high university and I dropped out to get some money aside to go to college and, or to go further in college. And that's when I got drafted. When I came back, uh, I couldn't concentrate. I had a hard time reading. Uh, I got uh, argument quite easy with people, fights, so forth. And I just passed that on, learned to live with it, and so forth. And here in about the last uh, three or four years, uh, 
Well, prior to that, they told us that the VA, while well, you weren't really injured, and injured, so don't worry about going to the VA or anything. So we just all passed that off at that time. But here in the last three or four years, uh, uh, a friend of mine that's with her in Vietnam, he says, well, you need to go to the VA and get your Asian Orange chemical testing. So one thing led to another. And they also uh, uh, gave me a test for PTSD. And, Post-traumatic uh, stress, stress disorder. disorder. And I found out that's where about 99% of my problems were. So I'm being treated for that presently. And I also here in out last year, they gave me total disability on that. How long have you been undergoing that treatment? For about a year, year and a half. Can I ask you a couple of personal questions? Yes. You married? Yes. How long have you been married? 35 uh, years. So you got married after you got back yes. from Vietnam? Yes. Did that ever create any problems for you in your marriage, do you think? Yes. My wife taught a little difference in the way I act now and the way I did beforehand. What was the issue? I, I would uh, I would get mad at the drop of a hat if she would make a suggestion or something silly. I would get mad real easy, very argumentative, tromp off. Just your kids uh, had uh, had a son that died in 1980 from neuroblastoma cancer. I also had two daughters, and uh, uh, probably the same way with them. I probably got mad at them a lot easier also. Do they notice a change in you now? Uh, probably, I, I believe so, yes. Okay. How do you feel now as compared to prior to? I understand what's caused, I knew I had problems, but I didn't know what was causing them. I didn't know, I didn't know what the problems were. But now I understand where, what's caused me to do certain things. It's easier to correct or understand not to get as mad as I was. What do you believe about the Vietnam experience is contributing to the problems that you now understand how to deal with? Uh, it, it was probably the, the stress and the experience I had over there, but on the other hand, it was a good experience in the long run. It helped mature me as an individual. It was a good experience I had, but I would not necessarily like to do it again, but it was a good experience at the time. Um, you brought a number. Well, let me ask you this. Are there any other significant things that you'd like to add at this time? None that, that I can that, think that of. That I, you know, yeah. have overlooked yeah. that you feel like you'd like to share with us. Yeah. None that I can think of. What do you think about Big Red One today? It's a great organization. Here this in, October, in September, correction, in August, they're having a Big Red Run convention in uh, Colorado Springs, and uh, I plan to go to, there to the convention and be my first one. Proud of your service in Big Red One? Yes. Okay. You have a number of uh, items that you've generously brought in for us to look at here um, that you feel are uh, significant. You want to share some of those with us? You can just talk about them on camera. Okay. Uh, Double One Blue Spader, this was the last uh, magazine that the battalion put out uh, right before the uh, we all split up. And the uh, battalion commander went through, and each company uh, basically gave the, out the information on uh, their company the prior year and experience they went through. And uh, I like that real well. Okay. And one of the items also... Uh, if I went to the 101st in order to get promoted, I had to go through their 101st uh, uh, Screaming Eagle course. And uh, my uh, uh, leader, who was in our uh, recondo group, he said, uh, possibly if I went through this and became a uh, uh, top uh, student out there, that uh, was supposed to be automatic promotion. Well, I went through it and became a uh, top student out of this uh, class, but I, because I was from the 1st Infantry Division, I did not get promoted. So I had to go before a promotion board. So that was a learning experience. And uh, several other pieces of information I've got off the internet here lately that I wanted to bring up and, uh, from various battalion and company commanders uh, present to you. What do we have here? This is a copy of my uh, award for a Bronze Star with a V for Valor. I received when I was in the 1st Infantry Division. I received this along with two other Bronze Star awards. And that would be related to the incident with the helicopter that yes. you described yes. earlier? Okay. 
Now I've got something else here. What do we got here? Uh, this is in, in the Rome plow in the, if I was in the first infantry division. Uh, leading up out of Saigon, coming from Cambodia, used to be a, a strip area uh, which the uh, North Vietnamese would come down in through from Cambodia and down to Saigon. And to help combat the uh, terrain, the uh, government uh, took an area about uh, 50 miles long, maybe as high, wide as 20 miles, and basically knocked the jungle down with bulldozers and used the Asian Orange to spray on this. And, and those were called, I'm sorry, those were called Rome Plow? Rome Plow area. Because they were manufactured in Rome, Georgia? Well, I don't know about that. Okay. It's knocked down. But anyway, uh, and the terrain was basically, the brush was like two or three feet high all around this area. And on the outer edges was uh, the Michelin River Plantation. And we would set up uh, first infantry, what we call first infantry booby traps in these areas, which would funnel the uh, uh, North Vietnamese Instead of going down through the rubber plantations, they'd have to go through the rubber, uh, Rome plow area. And uh, in order to run that, they'd have to do that at nighttime. And uh, it would be a pretty long ways to run during the nighttime to go from there to Saigon. So we just set up out there in six main ambush positions. And uh, as you see, the high okay, use our pumps. Okay, they running through would be the Vietnamese, Vietnamese the Viet North Cong. Vietnamese, yes. Okay. Running through there at nighttime. So we set up out there in six main ambush positions out in that area there. And that's just uh, me. Uh, in one of the areas we were setting up in. We'd go out and six up, set up in a fixed position for six or eight days in a row. How old are you in that picture? Nineteen. How long have you been in Vietnam at that point? Uh, probably four or five months. So you've probably lost 25 pounds at that point? Probably, yes. And you're down to about 150 pounds? Mm-hmm. It was a while ago, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> 39 years ago. Wow. Um, what do you think about when you look at that picture? Well, it kind of tells you a number of things. Uh, uh, you can see grenades and various equipment we used around the ground. 16, uh, the poncho liner we had up there, that was kind of a shade during the day. We had this big log here we laid under. And uh, we was out in the sun there, full blast of the sun, because you had no overhead cover. So the only water you had, what you carried in with you, the same with the food. Like I said, you were setting up there for five or six days in a row before you were airlifted out. And you're just waiting at night for the North Vietnamese to come yes. down through the area that's been plowed clear yes. by the Rome plow. You, you got brush setting up there. You got various trails leading there. We're setting up on a trail. Okay, so you've plopped down on one of their trails. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's it like sitting at night waiting for somebody to come along so you can shoot them? A lot cooler than it is through the day. <laughs> but uh, it? it's. Uh, you have to pay attention. Like I said, it's light noise discipline. Uh, you're no stronger than the weakest guy with you, so you got to make sure everybody's doing their job. Did you have good guys with you? Yes, the uh, Trigger 2 squad I was in, uh, you could count on every soldier that was with us. Oh, good. Have you gotten together with any of those guys since you've been back? Uh, you have contact with them? Yes. Uh, since I had my first knee operation here a few years ago, I've contacted all 11 of them. And uh, I've here. Talked to all of them. On, I've, I've talked to all of them on telephone. I've met with two or three of them. And uh, I think five of us are getting together out there at the uh, First Infantry Division convention here in, uh, this year. And so they all made it back? Yes. All made it back. Anything you'd want to add? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's. Yeah, it's two or three pictures. Uh, there's also a picture there of uh, the squad, most of the squad members in the frame picture there also. Okay, th these uh, are a number of my awards that received. This is from the um, Patch from the 1st Infantry Division. This is from the 101st, and I was in the 3rd Brigade Air, War Air Cavalry in the 101st. U.S. Army. This is the first and twenty-sixth uh, infantry uh, patch. That's uh, another uh, first and fifty-eighth patch right there. Uh, I was first sergeant in the High National Guard. I was, uh, in the seventy-third uh, infantry brigade in the High Guard. This is the CY patch in the High National Guard. Uh, these are my various uh, ribbons. Uh, had three bronze stars, one with valor, purple heart. Had three uh, 
air ribbons, meritorious service, good conduct, various other ribbons. Uh, here recently, I was uh, selected to uh, go into the High Military Academy for Valor. Uh, this was a program that they sent out. I believe the state of Ohio has the only uh, Hall of Fame for uh, military veterans for Valor. And I think I have a, uh, another pamphlet over here at this juncture here. As, uh, yeah, the top near the top uh, folder there. Yeah. Several of the items that they gave us for the Hall of Fame was uh, various uh, awards for various uh, dignitaries in the state and the federal government. Yeah, the other frames just uh, explain the. Uh, See a picture there, or a big, uh, you can see a picture, a big envelope there. I got that envelope. That big envelope. There should be a couple other items underneath. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, let's see that a second. Should be a little envelope down the bottom of that thing. One of the items for a high military hall of fame received from the uh, state of Ohio was the High Medal of Valor. That's not it, but anyway, uh, that's one of the items I received uh, from the state of Ohio. What do we have here? Okay, this here is the uh, probably the Trigger Two Squad I took a picture of. Uh, we were out in Fire Support Base, Oklahoma. Uh, the various members of the Triggers Two Squad: uh, Dennis Frickle, who lives in the Montana; uh, Robert Loner, lives in Chicago; uh, Tim Max, who lives in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania; uh, Larry Thomas, who lives in uh, Charleston, West Virginia; uh, Roy McKinney, who lives in Kentucky, but has passed away here last year or two years ago. Ray Pugh, who lives in Hilliard, Ohio. Uh, Mike Smith, who lives in uh, Bloomfield, Iowa. And uh, Don Riffle, who lives in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Where's that picture taken? This is taken over in uh, South Vietnam at uh, Fire Support Base, Oklahoma. Okay. That's where we come in for rest and relaxation. What do we got there? Okay, this is uh, me and uh, after I get back out of the hospital and uh, sent back to the company area in uh, Lake Hay. And this is our company area in the Michelin rubber plantation area. So you've just gotten back from having your wound treated? Yes, and yes. Here we go, LZ there, landing pad uh, there on the uh, helicopter landing pad, uh, LIK there, and he's getting ready to go out in a field mission, uh, waiting for a helicopter to come in so we can load up and uh, go out for another uh, six-man operation there. Here we are out in the field, uh, setting up for a night position up on a clearing here. Uh, I have the towel on here, uh, either let my shirt dry or maybe dry it off of it this time, but uh, we take a towel and slit it and use the shirt also. Again, this is uh, part of the Trigger 2 group. Uh, this is all but... Uh, Three of the members of the uh, Trigger Two Squad. Over in uh, South Vietnam, in the First Infantry Division, uh, we worked along uh, Highway 13 called Thunder Road, uh, led directly up to the Cambodia border. And uh, this is uh, some of the traffic you see along that road. This is one of the buses, the Vietnamese buses, and. Uh, Picture right there, there is. Uh, always like to use that picture there. Okay. 
you look at this picture here closely, it gives you various times of transportation in, in the, the Vietnamese had here. You got your motorcycle here, you got your ox cart or horse cart there, you got your little moped uh, cart here, you got your army vehicle here, and you got your walking. So you have all different types of transportation there that you used over there. What was the traffic like? Uh, about the way you see it right there, except for the army vehicles. <laughs> a little bit of everything that's on Highway 13. In our company area, uh, or at our company buildings, uh, we had our own little building, which uh, let's say had parties in, but you could have meetings in and so forth. We called it Instigator Inn. We had about three or four buildings like this in our company area. We got there maybe uh, a couple times for a couple nights during our uh, time in South Vietnam there. That's where a company, rear echelon people worked out of. You guys are looking a little dirty there. Well, here actually is in for a stand down. We went to a place called Dion, D-I-A-N, for a, a company stand down. Every 65 days, you got to go in there and stand for a stand down. You got to take clean showers, clean clothes, eat three hot meals a day. And anyway, one of the individuals found a monkey here, and he's kind of playing with the monkey uh, there. Uh, it was funny, uh, over there you could buy beer for nickel or beer for, or pop for nickel and beer for 10 cents, and so you could drink quite a bit of pop and beer for to get fluted on. And it was funny, one night uh, we were in bed, and we got to sleep inside of a building there, and somebody had a radio on full blast. And evidently, I was the only one hearing it, but it was too far gone, and they get up in the middle of the night to turn the thing off. And the next morning, I asked the guys, I said, hey, you guys hear about a, a rocket being shot off in the middle of the night and being hit by lightning? And I thought, they said, no, nah, you guys are just dreaming. And here was one of our, I forget which mission it was uh, at the time there. I think the Apollo mission was where the rocket shot off, oh. and it was struck by lightning going up through and like I said, that radio was on full blast, and of the 30 or 40 of us was in that building that night, I was the only one who heard that. Everybody else was that tired? That drunk. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. This is kind of a picture hard to see, but uh, we're out at Camp uh, Fire, Fire Support Base, Oklahoma. And this is part of the 1st Inf Infantry Division foxhole here with overhead cover. And you'll see a guy here taking a shower in the background there, and that's the type of shower I was talking about earlier. Uh, if you want to take a shower, uh, if you can find the shower bucket, you had to carry five gallons of bucket of water from somewhere, you can find it and put in that bucket, and you can stand underneath it and take a quick shower. So that was, I just took one of those after three months there. So Here are a couple pictures. Can you tell us about the conditions? Okay. When we was out in the field, when we come back into a fire support base, this is the type of conditions that we would... Uh, uh, acceptable to and to us this was uh, a little bit better than where we came from what time of year is that <laughs> this is during the monsoon season i think this is probably uh october november when we came into this and uh, basically what this is is uh, uh have a house or a battery there uh five or six guns and uh this is a and a, a circle of compound around it for fire support or protection and that's what we when we came into rear that's what this is what we did pull uh security for the howitzers there. And this is the type of wet train area you had coming into it. Also we're outside the uh, uh, Constantina wire there, bring helicopters in and land them. You had the hunter killer teams like uh, Loach helicopters, which was a light helicopter, and a Cobra gunship. Cobra gunship was a ship designed to fire rockets and uh, mini guns, which would fire up to six rounds, and, uh, rounds a minute. And uh, a Loach was a light observation helicopter that tried to draw fire then once they draw fire, they bring the Cobra gunship in to fire up the area. One more. Okay, this is a, a 1st Infantry Division uh, foxhole with overhead cover, and you had firing ports out on each side, which fired out at 45 degree angles and stuff straight ahead. And if the enemy tried to come at you straight ahead, uh, they wouldn't likely hit you because you fired out in an angle, and they couldn't hit you directly on. And also we have uh, this uh, grass cutting size there in front. That was one of the extra jobs you had to do when you came in from the field. You had to cut grass. So uh, you had plenty of details. So you had a fire zone in front of you? Yes. Mm -hmm. one, I guess one more. What do we got here? Uh, <clears throat> out in the field, uh, you'd have uh, flights of ship come in. Uh, if you get ready to pull a company in and out of the field, uh, you'd have maybe five or six ships come in, uh, helicopters come in at one time. And you'd have a numbering system on who would get on a helicopter, which flight. And this is one of the flights taking off. And one of the choice seats is sitting on the edge of the helicopter uh, with your feet hanging out over the side. Why is that? <coughs> uh, 
uh, more air, more exhilarating there. What are the faces like there? What do you see? Relief. Why? Because we're going back into the prior support base, the place I just showed you from. So you're you're going, you're not coming. Right. To the front. Right. We're go going to fire support base where they might get a hot meal and maybe fresh milk. And, and everybody looks pretty happy. There. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. We're not getting fired at this time. We're moving out. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Anything you'd like to add? Like I said, accidents do happen over there. Just uh, like I said, we like to go into the rear and get uh, fresh milk and hot food. And uh, one time uh, we all got fresh milk and we went out the field the uh, following morning after breakfast we got fresh milk and went out the field and here all the milk was bad and, and everybody in my squad got sick so we weren't able to go in place for about a day. We was out in the field there, we had to kind of set in place and all this puked our guts out for the rest of the day. <laughs> well, than that, it wasn't too bad. We did a few other things but uh, that's the only, probably the only thing I say put on camera. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah.